the Biden administration has been largely silent on issues of space policy. And in that silence, I've seen a lot of questions be asked about the Space Force, why it should be a separate branch, and why it's important for the US to start modernizing its defenses in space. And today, I want to tackle that issue headlong. In today's video, I'm going to tell you why the US needs to present defensive posture and offensive capabilities in space, and how US assets in space could come under threat. The first misconception I see people making about space is that it's not militarized. Space has been militarized ever since the US launched the first anti-satellite weapon only two years after Sputnik. So space is a inherently militarized domain from military communications, earth observation, and remote control. So instead we should be worried about the weaponization of space, which is an important distinction to make. Because even now the space domain is largely a remote one. Space isn't used for its own inherent purposes, but rather used to benefit activities here on the ground, both in a military and commercial sense. I like to kind of use how air travel developed in the early 1900s as a good metaphor for this. I mean, you saw planes being used sparingly in conflict and in commercial uses, but it wasn't until they got cheap enough and fast enough to mass produce that you saw them actually revolutionize warfare like they did in World War II. And before I continue, I just want to say that a lot of the information I'm going to talk about in today's video is provided by the Center for Strategic and International Studies in a paper called, somewhat cornily, Defense Against the Dark Arts in Space, Protecting Space Systems from Counterspace Weapons, by Todd Harrison, Caitlin Johnson, and McKenna Young. But with that out of the way, I want to say why the US is at a strategic disadvantage when it comes to the weaponization of space. This is because the US has been largely benefiting from this revolution in space. It still controls the majority of satellites, and the US commercial space industry has been leaps and bounds ahead of any other nation, especially China. So instead of trying to challenge American authority in space head on, a lot of these actors have been resorting to asymmetrical means of undermining American dominance in space. This is done mostly through counter space weapons. The most notable examples are obviously anti-satellite weapons. These often come in the range of air launch or ground launched missiles. These weapons can be characterized by their suborbital trajectory and their use of a conventional or nuclear warhead. Now their counterparts, non-kinetic weapons like uplink jammers, laser dazzlers, and cyber attacks can be used by earthbound actors to disrupt and interfere with satellite communications with their ground stations. The big plus side to these types of weapons is that they won't produce orbital debris, which for nations like the US with large constellations already in orbit is a definite plus. The usage of these weapons is also less likely to be perceived as an attack as they can be used without any real damage to the infrastructure operating, which also is a dangerous proposition because you could see these attacks becoming more frequent. And while they may be perceived as less escalatory options, they are still an escalation and normalizing it could be dangerous. Next is the category of space to space weapons. This is a less used category of weapon just because of the ease of use of having a ground launched anti-satellite missile versus putting one in orbit. Now these have been tested by the Soviet Union and by Russia, who is believed to have tested an on-orbit kill vehicle sometime in the past two years. On-orbit kill vehicles work by orbiting a satellite near enough to an object that a detonation by the satellite could render it inoperable. Because of the fragility of in-space hardware, it's very likely that very small warheads could be used on these kill vehicles, which means they would be increasingly hard to spot by ground-based surveillance. This could give nations the capability of a perfect first strike in space. These weapons could allow malicious actors to disable satellites while making it look like an accident since the initial warhead wasn't detected. A much harder thing to do with Earth launched missiles. On orbit attacks could also come in the form of on orbit jamming. This could be done both intentionally and made to look like an accident, where a communication satellite could drift into the path of another more important military satellite and jam its signals through interference. This could be made to look like an accident and give actors plausible deniability, a very important thing when it comes to international relations. 
now comes what could be the most interesting but ludicrous ways to weaponize space. Kinetic space to ground warheads. These could come in the form of kinetic tungsten rods or nuclear bombs dropped from space. Anyway, you call it Star Wars strategic defense initiatives or downright crazy, it is something that's been considered by the US military and I'm sure others, but again, why do that when you could just have ballistic missiles? But an interesting capability could come from space-based jamming, which allows very precise, accurate, and omnipotent jamming of anything in view of the satellite. It could also use lasers to blind ground-based observation posts, or even attempt to use lasers or directed energy weapons to disable ballistic missiles in flight. Who knows, crazier things have been done, and in the future this could certainly become a possibility. But as for steps that can be taken now to defend the space domain and to assure American dominance in space for the years to come, the paper does make several recommendations. First of all, in the event of a conflict, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. And in low number satellite constellations that are crucial for American security, like the space-based infrared surveillance satellites, which detect missile launches and provide crucial orderly warning capabilities to US forces, means that you need to have a diversified and as they say, disaggregated constellation, which distributes capabilities in order to assure that the loss of one satellite doesn't mean the loss of the entire constellation. Luckily, the solution is gonna become an increasingly easier one to implement as the launch costs go down and down, especially with SN10 sticking its latest landing, it's safe to say that launch costs are gonna continue to go down in the near future. And I mean, you're already seeing Congress and the government implement this with $130 million already being approved for the use of a constellation to detect hypersonic weapons. This new hypersonics tracking constellation is implementing another recommendation made by the paper to have multiple layers in your satellite constellation that all operate independently of each other and can take a hit. This constellation is gonna have five separate layers, which again just adds a huge new level of redundancy and interoperability. Another recommendation which I found pretty interesting is to explicitly separate targets with commercial and military value by making satellites do only one job. This means that you can clearly see if an attack is aimed at just a retaliatory response against a relatively non-important commercial target, or if it's targeting a nuclear response satellite, for instance. Again, just giving policymakers more knowledge about what's happening in the space domain. When it comes to space policy, imperfect information is even more of a threat than it is in day-to-day -day international relations. This is just because of how little we can know about the space domain due to its distance and difficulty of operation in. In the air, land, and sea domains, human and robotic surveillance is much easier. But in space, everything has to be done by robots thousands of miles away from each other and movings at thousands of miles per hour. The cost of in-space hardware also means that being the attacker gives you a significant advantage. Attacking only costs you the missile, defending can cost you the whole satellite. This means that countermeasures are an incredibly valuable way of defending your in-space hardware, especially because countermeasures are inherently non-threatening. These can again take two main forms, passive and active. Active defenses include maneuvering, spoofing, launching decoys, and even active interception of warheads intercepting the satellite. While passive defenses can take the form of stealth, or software that turns off the sensors of dazzled satellites to prevent permanent damage. Again, you can see how redundancy could be beneficial in this situation. If one satellite is dazzled and is forced to shut down, another satellite can step in in its place immediately. The paper then goes on to describe scenarios in which space events could affect and escalate events here on Earth. I won't go into them now, if you want to look at them you can go read the paper which I'm going to provide in the description but they are a very interesting insight into how policymakers can think about scenarios going on in space, and they're largely hindered by the lack of information and norms about operations in space.
Plausible deniability is very easy to establish in space where operations are very difficult and you can say a satellite was just wandering out of orbit or had a failure and that's the reason it exploded. The creation of a rulebook for actors in space would also be a very helpful addition to the policymakers handset because unlike operations here on earth where say trespassing could easily be met with deadly force it's much harder to set hard boundaries in space where conjunctions happen daily and it's often impossible to divert satellites in time without severely impacting their time on orbit which again is another dissatisfactory outcome the creation of a branch of the military to fight this problem might seem like somewhat of an overreaction. I mean, even I'll admit to kind of chuckling when I saw the Space Force flag at the inauguration, but space is becoming an increasingly important domain of American dominance, and creating the Space Force is just another way to show American commitment to its allies and the international order in space, which I think is a good thing. While we won't be seeing space marines anytime soon, I do think the Space Force should be here to stay. I'm Cosmos Content, signing off.